Conditional probability is an absolutely basic idea that we use all the time. It's the probability that some event occurs given certain information about it. For example, um, an insurance company wants to know uh, what's the probability that you'll live for the next 10 years given your medical history. Or a typical investor wants to know what's the probability that this stock is going to rise given its stock price gy gyrations for the past month. There are people who actually think you can do that, that the chartists, that not knowing anything about the nature of the company or the business that the, st uh, that the stock um, uh, is part of, that just by watching the, the price gyration, you can make a better guess on what the stock will do tomorrow than you could otherwise. Um, another good example is uh, for a system engineer, what's the probability that the system is going to overload given the recent history of the rate at which requests have been coming in? And finally, as a, uh, a joke that I like to think about is, uh, what's the probability that you're a cat owner given that you're sitting in the cat section of the Angel Memorial Veterinary Hospital? Okay, so let's look concretely at, an, uh, at uh, a very simple example of co co conditional probability that's meant to be illustrative, where we look at a die uh, and rolling a fair die. Okay, now if I'm thinking about an ordinary fair die, I've got six outcomes that are equally likely. The outcomes are one, two, three, four, five, six. And if I ask what's the probability that in one roll I roll a one, well, it's going to be uh, the number of outcomes involving my rolling a one. Uh, divided uh, by the total number of outcomes. It's one-sixth. The probability of any given face of a six-sided fair die is one-sixth. But suppose I give you some additional information. Knowledge about the role can change the judgment of probabilities. Suppose that I tell you that I rolled an odd number, and now I want to know what's the probability that I rolled a one. And the answer will now be that Given that, that it's an odd number, the only possibilities are 1, 3, and 5. And so the probability has changed to 1 third. Yeah. That should be a straightforward enough idea. Let's look at it, though. One way to understand conditional probability is as a kind of an experiment, where first you try to roll an odd number, and then you, you decide what final roll you're going to make. Let's look at that tree if we were describing it that way. So the first branch of the tree that we'll use to build a probability space uh, is to say, OK, among the six possible outcomes, what are the chances that we rolled an odd number? Well, it's 50-50 because there were three of each. So there's a half chance that, yes, you rolled an odd number, in which case those are the possible outcomes, or a half chance that, no, you didn't roll an odd number, and the possible outcomes then are 2, 4, and 6. Now, once you're here with 1, 3, and 5, uh, let's ask whether you rolled a 1. The probability that you did roll a 1, we've already agreed, is 1 third. It's, one, it's equally likely to be any one of those three outcomes, which means that it's 2 thirds that you wind up uh, rolling either a 3 or a 5. And likewise here, the probability uh, if you uh, didn't roll an odd number, that is you rolled an even number, the probability that next you'll roll a 1 is uh, 0, or that you won't roll a 1 is probability 1. So this is a kind of standard way that we have of, of trying to build up uh, uh, a set of probabilities for outcomes. And if we look at this tree, well, first of all, we can use it to assign some probabilities, because the probability of your rolling a 1 is 1 sixth as it should be. It's a half times a third, which is the usual way we would calculate the probability of this outcome. By the way, we could calculate the probability of the outcome being 3 or 5. It would be a half times 2 thirds or 1 third. And finally, the probability of uh, rolling an even number would just be a half, a half times one. Now, what's going on here? Well, if you look at this number one third, it is what we said was the probability of a one given that you rolled an odd number. So that's where this label came from. Likewise, this number two thirds is the probability that you didn't roll a one given that you rolled an odd number. And finally, this number is the probability that you didn't roll a 1, given that you rolled an even number. And it's certain. All right. Let's do another example to get this idea across. Let's go back to Monty Hall, which we've seen before. Remember how we have these lab the probability labels 
on these branches, which we figured out. So if we look at this number, a third, what is it? Well, this is where, where the prize is at location one and the contestant has picked door one. And that one third, we figured out that once the prize is at door one, in fact, it, uh, whatever, wherever the prize is, the probability that the contestant will pick one is one third. This number one third is the probability the contestant will pick one given that the prize is at door one. Yeah. Here's another third. This is similarly the probability that the contestant will pick door two given that the prize is at door three. That's symmetric to this one. But here's something a little bit different. Here's a half. This is the probability that door three will be opened by Carol given that the prize is at one, that's that branch, and the contestant picked one. And when the prize is at one and the contestant picks one, Carol, we said in our model, is equally likely to, uh, to open uh, the two possible doors that have goats that she's able to open. And so that's one half is this conditional probability, the probability that she'll open door three given this, that we're in this location in the tree, given that the prize is at one and pick is at one. So the point is simply that we were reasoning about conditional probability in the very way we began defining the tree model that we were using to define probability spaces in the first place. We were implicitly using conditional probabilities to label the probabilities that left each vertex of the tree. And in fact, formally speaking, what we were using was the product rule, which is that the probability um, that uh, an A event occurs and a B event occurs is simply the probability that the A event, that's the first branch of the tree, times the probability of B given A. Okay, and that's the fundamental rule of conditional probabilities. That's the product rule. And it's something to be memorized. Now, in fact, this product rule is not a corollary. It's really the definition of conditional probability. Um, so all of the previous discussion was motivation of the following definition. If A and B are events in a probability space, the probability of B given A uh, is defined to be the probability that A and B occur, the that is A intersection B, relative to the probability of A. So that's the formal definition. So, by, so this formal definition justifies the product rule by definition because you just multiply both sides by the probability of A and you get probability of A times the probability of B given A as the probability of the intersection. Notice that implicit in this definition is the probability of A better not be zero. So you can't condition on an event that has zero probability. Probability of B given A is only defined if probability of A is positive. Okay. Um, the, if you have a tree that's of depth three, then you need a product rule for three consecutive choices, and it generalizes in a straightforward way. Namely, the probability of A and B and C, the first branch is A and the second branch is B and the third branch is C, is the probability that you do A on the first branch times the probability that you do B on the second branch, given that you did A on the first branch, and times the probability that you do C on the third branch, given that you did A on the first and B on the second. And this, this product rule for three could in fact be proved simply by substitution using the product rule for two twice. Um, and of course it generalizes to any finite number of sets. It's useful to think, another useful way to think about probability that may be uh, more intuitive than the idea of choosing to whether or not to roll odd and then choosing to roll whether or not to roll a one. Usually what you think of is you roll the dice and then you're giving me some information about what that roll was. I don't think about the odds of rolling odd or not. I just tell you it's odd and now tell me what is the probability that among the, those odd outcomes it was one. So. A way to formalize that is you can think of conditioning on an event A as defining a new probability function on the sample space. Once you're given that A occurred, I can now think that all the probabilities of the sample of the outcomes have changed. So in this, I'll define a new probability measure relative to A, where all the outcomes that are not in A are going to be assigned probability zero because they can't happen given that A occurred, and all of the probabilities of outcomes of points 
in A, uh, just they get their probability relative, uh, raised in proportion to A, because now A is going to be the whole probability space. Let's be a little bit more formal about that. To be precise, we're going to define a new probability function, probability sub A, on the same sample space, uh, where the probability of an outcome is zero if the if the outcome is not in A, and it's, it's old probability relativized to the probability of A if omega is in A. So that's the definition of the probability with, uh, with respect to A of omega. It's a new probability measure on the same sample space. So to verify that this new thing is a probability space, you have to verify that the sum of the outcomes of the outcome probabilities is one. And that's a little exercise that I would encourage you to stop now and work out on a piece of paper because it's trivial, but it's worth uh, checking that you follow the definitions. The claim is simply that this new measure, probability sub A, is A will satisfy all of the rules of probability because it is a probability measure. So for example, I have the difference rule restated for conditional probabilities. Given that the this that probability sub A is a probability measure, it satisfies the difference rule, which means when I translate it into a conditional probability statement, I get that the probability of B minus C given A is equal to the probability of B given A minus the probability of B intersection C given A. It's exactly the same as the standard difference rule except that I have uh, made everything conditioned on A. And so we automatically get all of these uh, rules uh, for conditional probability that we had holding for probability, which will be helpful. We won't have to think about proving them again.